they may not see that actually there's a lot of tension there and it's probably may be worse after they pass away when the family dynamics change and mom or dad is no longer there. Uh, and then all of a sudden the gloves come off. Welcome everybody to the Steady Hand Coffee Break series. Today, we're lucky to have Margaret O'Sullivan, a seasoned estate lawyer practicing in Toronto. And Margaret, you and I have taped a complimentary video outlining the detailed uh, the details around appointing and working as an executor in your estate. Now, you've got a ton of experience working with estate situations, and I'm sure you and your team have seen all kinds of nightmare situations and scenarios. And so following on that video that we did earlier about appointing an executor, what are the top mistakes that Canadians tend to make when actually choosing their executor? And following that, what are the top mistakes that an executor makes in carrying out his or her duties? Well, let's talk about mistakes in choosing their executor. And um, I think based on my experience, I think it's really not um, understanding the true family dynamics. People often look, for example, let's say their spouse may have passed away. They're going to appoint their three children or their two children. Well, one of the first questions I'm going to ask is, well, how do they get along? <laughs> and, um, and then I'm told, well, actually not very well. Oh, well, you know, do you get together at Christmas time or holiday time or whatever? Well, no, actually, I don't think they talk very much together. Well, I think I'm going to then say, well, do you think it's going to be any better having the two of them now be the executors or the three of them? In fact, aren't we maybe walking into a bit of a, a landmine by doing that or minefield? So I think questioning what the relationships are are really important because people just somehow assume that, well, they're my children and therefore both of them should have. What are the alternatives? Uh, well, that's what we can then explore. And perhaps maybe we might say, well, since they don't have particularly a good relationship, but you do want them to be the executors, what about having another person act with them? Maybe a neutral party. Maybe having that neutral party actually have a veto. So essentially they've got to be part of any decision. That could be possible. So there, there is an idea there. So I think um, I mentioned the true family dynamics. So sometimes I think parents have a tendency to look a little bit through, you know, their rose tinted glasses at their children. And they may not see that actually there's a lot of tension there. And it's probably may be worse after they pass away when the family dynamics change and mom or dad is no longer there. Uh, and then all of a sudden the gloves come off. Uh, and we see that in many situations and often, you know, unfortunately involves that, you know, valuable Canadian asset, the family cottage. That's where we really do see it a lot. So I think really understanding that dynamics is important. I remember a situation where I had a, a longstanding client and uh, um, he wanted to appoint his four children and his spouse. Well, that's quite a few executives. But um, I had a little bit of an inkling about some of the issues and the spouse and some tension between her and one of the children. And then I seem to recall hadn't the son been in some kind of litigation uh, with the family company. And sure enough, yes, that was the case. Well, do you think this is really a good idea, having four children and mom when they really, there is tension and there's been some litigation? Maybe that's not such a good idea. But this very astute business person really had not really thought of it that way. And then he started to think about it. And then he thought about it some more. And then ultimately the decision was made for the spouse to act with his CFO and his longtime accountant. Probably the best decision he ever made, because I think otherwise, probably right from the get-go, we would have been into a family dispute. So really important to kind of really drill down and just don't sort of have the automatic um, response in terms of family members, because often you're doing them a much better service by having maybe none of them act and having an independent or maybe a trusted company who essentially now they can complain to them, not to each other, which will certainly not improve family relationships going forward. So you don't want the estate to be the essentially uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of the relationships of the children going forward or the other family members. So that's one mistake. I think the other big mistake is thinking that one person should, should, should have the role and not thinking of having a team, particularly in a situation where there are other beneficiaries and maybe there are substantial assets and they're being held maybe 
on continuing trust, whatever the situation is. But having just one person really quite perplexes me. I'm not comfortable with that idea. See, too many situations, too many cases in their law reports of situations where that just invited, um, you know, could be misappropriation or some kind of improper activity, um, or just this fact that the person maybe wasn't able to carry out the role and it kind of just kept dragging on and on and on. And they were really the only person responsible and nobody really knew what was going on and had a great difficulty in getting the information. So I think that's really, it's better to have a bit of diversification on the executorship and have other people involved as well to prevent that. And is there one single big mistake that you've seen the executors making in carrying out their responsibilities? Well, one issue could be investments <laughs> and maybe having too high risk uh, a portfolio that then ended up causing issues later on and complaints. So that can be an issue uh, in terms of what, you know, can, can arise. I find though that, you know, it's kind of a bit of a, Anomaly, but the, the issue that seems to invite a, 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 invite a lot of controversy is how much the executor should be paid and executor compensation. Um, it's my view that that shouldn't be an issue that gets resolved and figured out after somebody dies. That should be something contemplated when they're drafting their will. But often it's not. I mean, I would say that the vast majority of wills do not have any mention of what the compensation will be. And I think the testator, the person drawing the will, has no idea what his executors or her executors will be paid. It's just one of these sleeper issues. And I think they'd be quite surprised to find out later of the amount of money that, in fact, could be claimed by the executor, particularly in a large estate. So I think it's much better to address the issue in the will, figure out a formula, figure out a flat fee, figure out an hourly rate or some combination or particular people have different ways in which they're compensated. Often professionals, it will be their hourly rate, but at least deal with it. Uh, so the testator knows what's coming and there aren't any surprises. And when, you know, often family members, the testator would want them to be paid and not to be feeling that they have to act under some kind of family obligation to do it without any compensation. So all those issues can be thrashed out. So probably that's the biggest mistake, I think, is not dealing with compensation, which then invites a dispute and a lot of legal fees that could have been saved if the issue had been dealt with. I think that's a really interesting point. So in summary, the biggest mistake is tied somewhere between that that the that the person planning their state is tied somewhere between not being explicit about compensation for his or her executors, but also choosing his or her executors on, on principles that are sort of more related to family rather than the practicality of who can actually carry and who should carry this out efficiently. And as you pointed out earlier, there's a real risk that this, this dynamic is what actually drives families further apart rather than bringing them together. So that'd be the big mistake on the side of the, the choice of an executor. And then the, ex, the executor, um, interestingly, so the, 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 the person dies, their investments are invested, the executor chooses to do nothing about that, and there's a market downfall just at the time when the assets are gonna be liquidated. And that might take six months, 12 months, 18 months, or what have you. So you would argue that one of the biggest or one of the first things an executor might do is reconsider the investment profile in order to manage risk to the beneficiaries. That's correct. I think when you're an executor, that's one thing you're always should be cognizant of. What if there is a decline, whether it be in the real estate market or in the investments and how to deal with that in an orderly way, particularly looking at what, in fact, is the timeline for the estate? If it's an outright distribution and it's all going out within a year, well, you're going to probably make a different decision with regard to the risk profile versus, you know, you're managing a trust for 25 years. Okay, so, but to be, you know, very careful because unfortunately, um, you know, beneficiaries may complain if there's a significant drop in the portfolio 
and the executor really was not monitoring it and was not taking appropriate steps to essentially diversify or minimize risk um, by perhaps moving some of the portfolio or a good chunk of it into cash or near cash. Well, Margaret, that's a wrap for this video. Thank you so much for giving this uh, the insight into your practice, working with Canadians every day on their estate planning and estate um, settlement uh, issues. And we'll link to your uh, website where people, I'm sure, will be interested in, in finding out more about what you do and the resources that you provide, including signing up for your newsletter. Thank you, everybody, for watching. If you have any questions, comments, uh, or feedback for us, please put them into the comments. And if you're not yet subscribed to the Steady Hand YouTube channel, we encourage you to subscribe so that you can be notified of new videos as soon as they're released. Margaret, again, thank you. And thank you all for watching. Bye for now.